Welcome to our service today. You who are here in the sanctuary and you folks who are at home, we're so glad to have all of you with us today as we worship the Lord together. Let's begin our worship today with our call to, to, to worship and we'll read it responsively as printed in the bulletin and I trust you folks at home will also see that and do it with us. Let us begin. Jehovah Jireh, let your spirit fill my soul. Your love is overflowing. We need you with us on our daily walk. With you, there is light. Come, let us worship God who is light. God in prayer. Loving God, we praise you that you offer us hope, and we ask that in this worship service today, you would grant us grace to ground our lives in your vision, so that we may have hope when all seems hopeless. For we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Put 
put my mic on. There we go. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. I would like to welcome everyone to worship this morning, either here in the sanctuary or at home. Good morning, folks at home, wherever the camera is. Um, I would like to invite everyone at home um, to print off the music at the bottom of the email with our Zoom link for the um, Sunday morning worship so that you may participate and sing um, the hymns at home because we're singing them here. Uh, you're just lucky that you don't have to do it behind your mask. <laughs> um, Pastor Mark will be starting a class following the service this Sunday for those, right? For the Pastor Burke. It says Pastor Burke here, and I said Pastor Mark. Sorry. Um, Sorry. My, as the kids say, my B. Um, for those interested in learning about baptism or church membership, um, please contact the church office or actually hang around, and, and um, Pastor Burke will be able to um, direct you and let you know what's what. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the SCBC ladies had a nice time on Friday night, both in person and on Zoom. Uh, we started off with a little stretching to get our juices flowing, and then we followed it up with some conversation. Um, the goal is to do this once a, once a month and bring it outside, actually, as soon as the weather gets warm enough to do so, um, so that more ladies can come and join in. Um, and I hope everyone can join in next time. The church council meets at 12.30 today. Uh, there was a Zoom link sent out in an email by our church early bird, apparently, Mallory, um, at 5.14 a.m. yesterday. Um, just check your email for the thread from Neil at, at a decent hour. Um, he sent it out on Friday. And the children will be dismissed after the old rugged cross. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Clark, and I'm the chair of the Senior Pastor Search Committee. Over the last several months, the Search Committee has reviewed, assessed, and interviewed a number of individuals who have applied to be the next Senior Pastor of Scarsdale Community Baptist Church. The Search Committee has identified and unanimously voted to make a recommendation for Pastor Dan Hintz to be our next senior pastor. So I, I think that's some great news. Our constitution is, indicates that once the search committee makes the recommendation, the proposed candidate needs to come forward and preach a candidating sermon um, to the congregation. We have scheduled um, March 14th as that Sunday. So that's a couple of Sundays from now. And I really want to encourage everyone to make every effort to attend, either in person or virtually, uh, to hear and worship with us um, that Sunday where Pastor Hintz will be here. We are planning on a number of events for the period of March 10th through March, March 14th. Pastor Hintz currently resides in Wisconsin and he'll be flying in and going through the COVID protocols, but we're scheduling and working through a number of events that we'll be hosting. Um, and the idea around that is to give our congregants as much opportunity as possible to interact and get to know uh, Pastor Hintz and his family um, leading up into the 14th. Will Fowler, who is on the Senior Pastor Search Committee, um, has been asked, volunteered, to lead this effort and, and an email communication will be going out um, in the next few days um, with the different events that will be hosted between that period of time, um, March 10th through March 14th, so that everyone has a chance to participate, um, both folks who have been coming into the sanctuary or into the building, as well as folks who have been remote throughout this period of time. In addition, a bio of Pastor hints will be made available and distributed to all the members so you'll have some background information on him. Once we have that service on March the 14th, um, what the Constitution calls for is for us as a congregation to have a vote. 
And we're working through the logistics of that, if it's going to be that day, later in that day, or early in the week. But we'll, we'll, we'll communicate that out in the next um, few days in terms of what the plans are. So overall, great news. Um, the search committee has been able to identify a great new senior pastor, um, an undertaking that no one knew um, how it would unfold when you think about it in the midst of a pandemic. And uh, it's been a blessing, um, and it kind of reflects, once again, something that we all know, that God is in charge. So once again, please make every effort to attend in person or via Zoom on March 14th. Uh, to worship with us as we hear from Pastor Dan Hintz. And in addition, please uh, look into your email because we'll be sending out information about the different activities and events which will be hosted through that period of time. Uh, so thank you. Good morning. The scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. The resurrection of Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believed. This is the word of the Lord. Just one further announcement before we have the morning prayer. Today we'll be beginning a class on membership and baptism. A couple of people will have already signed up for it. But we'll be meeting today in the Hanson Lounge following the morning service. If you're interested in becoming a member or being baptized and becoming a member, I, I invite you to join us in the class. You who are at home, we will be doing it virtually as well beginning next week. And we invite you also uh, to be involved in that even though you're not here in the sanctuary. So we look forward to that uh, today in the Hanson Lounge following the morning service. Let's look to God in prayer, shall we? Gracious Heavenly Father, Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And we come this morning with humility. We come this morning with love. We come this morning with awe for who you are and for your love for us and that you are the God who does provide. And oh, our God, as we come today with awe, humility, and love for you, we, again, we stand in awe and with such gratitude in our hearts that you who created the heavens and the earth, you who know all about us, you who are all-powerful, 
that you loved us enough to send your Son to be our Redeemer. Oh, our God, we just pray that daily during this Lenten season, we'll focus on you and on what you did for us and on your Son and his work on Calvary's cross, and that we in ourselves would examine our own lives. And Lord, we do confess that so many times we have failed you. We have sought our own way. We've not consulted you. We've wanted to do our own thing and do it our way instead of your way. And we ask your forgiveness for that. And our Father, we pray that in the days ahead that we'll be more attuned with you, that we will seek your presence in our lives daily, that we would experience your presence. And Lord, we realize that when we do that, it, it gives us such joy, it gives us such a feeling of security. But then, our God, we confess that sometimes, even in our prayers, we're selfish. We want what would benefit us. Oh, our God, help us be more mindful of you and seek what would honor you most and that would also reach out and help others rather than just praying for ourselves. And so, our Father, today as we're gathered here in this service, we do pray for each one here and each of our church members and friends who are listening at home that you would meet our needs according to your will that you would bless. And then, Father, we think of others who are going through difficult times. We think of Ellen Heffron's daughter, Kristen, recuperating from surgery. Lord, we pray you'd be with her, that you would give her the grace she needs as she goes through this difficult time of recuperation. You'd guide those who care for her also to help her. We pray for Will Tejan as he recuperates from the COVID virus there at his dorm room in Rochester, New York. We pray, Lord, for healing for him and also for your grace to sustain him. And then, Lord, we think of others, others who are going through difficult times, family members of our church family, some who are being tested for various illnesses, and we pray you'd guide the doctors who care for them and bless them, Lord. And then, Father, we pray for people who are afflicted with the virus. We pray for healing. We think of the families of those who have died because of it. Lord, we just pray that your grace would sustain them, that your peace, which passes all understanding, would watch over them like a sentinel day by day. We think even of some churches that have lost their pastor due to the virus, that you would sustain and bless those churches. Our Father, again, we pray as we pray for our church, and we give you thanks, Lord, for our search committee. And we give you thanks that the pastoral candidate will be coming soon to meet the congregation. We pray your blessing upon him as he prepares, and your blessing upon the congregation as we prepare for his arrival. Our Father, we ask today not only for ourselves, but we think of missions throughout our nation. We think of home missions. We know that you have called us not only to care for ourselves, and we, we believe that's important, but Lord, you have called us to reach out with the message of the gospel, both at home and throughout our own country and throughout the world. And we ask, as we think of our missionaries, we ask, Lord, that you'd give us a greater burden for missions. For, Father, we, we know and we confess that a church that doesn't have a mission burden is a dying church. And we pray, Lord, that you would give our churches, not only ours, but all churches, that preach the word of God, a greater burden for missions. Now we ask your blessing upon us in this service, and we'll give you all the praise and the glory. For We ask this in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen.
Well, sorry for the back-to-back -back children's messages um, each week, or this week, folks, but um, it is what it is. Okay. Um, we have a small but mighty crowd of, of children in the sanctuary, to, uh, in the sanctuary today. Um, but uh, so hopefully they'll be able to answer a couple of questions um, in our discussion. I've been thinking this week about disciples and apostles. When you hear the word disciple, boys and girls, or apostle, what do you think? What comes to mind? Bradley. Nice and loud. Everyone in church who believes in God. Well, I'm done here because that's exactly. <laughs> here's, the here's the point. Never ask a smart child an answer in the beginning of a children's message. No, no, you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. Everyone who is here and, and, and um, in church and everyone who is here to learn about God. Okay. I used to use the word apostle and disciple you know, interchangeably, you know, for, I used to think they were kind of the same thing, but actually they're not. One's a continuation of the other. The, the word disciple means learner or student, and the word apostle, it means messenger or the one who is sent to, out to teach people. So you need to become a disciple before you become an apostle. All right, so actually this membership class that Pastor Burke was talking about, about membership and church membership, they're really teaching people to be a disciple, they're teaching people to be disciples so that they can become apostles, all right? We need to learn about God and, um, and then go out and tell everybody else about him, okay? Now, um, I love this song, There Were Twelve Disciples. I cannot remember anything unless it's set to music. I can, I can name all, I can list all 50 states um, in alphabetical order because I learned it as a song. I can sing you the books of the Old and New Testament because I learned them as a song. And I also learned um, that There Were Twelve Disciples as a song. And I used to teach this in children's church when we had children's church. So when we're back to that, the kids will learn this too. It goes, there was 12 disciples, Jesus called to help him, Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, his brother, John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, Judas, and Bartholomew. He has called us to, he has called us to, we are his disciples, I am one and you. He has called us to, he has called us to, we are his disciples, we his work must do. All right, so, we his work must do. What work is that? I boiled it down. Thank you, thank you. I, and I actually stole that song. I didn't even make it up, so, so how's that? But it's a great way to learn the, tw the name of the 12 disciples. But, all right, I've boiled this whole idea of discipleship and then apostleship to three steps. What are the three major things that you think that, um, uh, that disciples are supposed to learn and then go out and teach? I boiled it down to the first, oh, yes. Brad oh, well, we have got Athena in the back. Yes, Bradley. Say it. Children. Children. Yeah, children are so important. Yes, children need to learn all this too. Miss Athena, did you have something to say nice and loud, loud and proud? What was the question? All right, well, the first thing that God wants us to learn is to love. Athena, who do you think he wants us to love? God. He wants us to love God. Who else? Who else are we supposed to learn? Jamie? Jesus. Jesus. Who else? William Diego, can you think of, no? Okay. Anybody else? Yes, Braden. Each other. 
Yes. Even, even the people who annoy us? Yes. Yeah. So we learn, when we read the Bible, we learn that God tells us that we're supposed to love everybody. God, Jesus, other people, and then go out and teach other people to do the same. Okay. Jamie, in a related question, he wants us to serve. And he tells us over and over in the Bible we're supposed to serve other people. Jamie, who do you think we're supposed to serve? God and Jesus. Thank you for the church answers. Braden. Each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, is he want, does he want us to serve people like this? Okay, here you go. No, he wants us to do it with a loving heart, okay? So we're supposed to learn to love and serve and go out and do other people. And the last thing I boiled it down to is doing it boldly. He wants us to go out and be bold. He wants us to love boldly. He wants us to serve boldly. He wants us to tell other people about him and his love boldly. All right? So all of the apostles, I'm sorry, all of the disciples and all of the apostles here and in the sanctuary, let's follow those three, those three um, uh, commandments that God, get, that God wants us to learn and then go out and do. He wants us to be his disciples, and then he wants us to be his apostles. Let's pray. Hold that thought, Jamie. Gracious God, please let us to be bold. Give us courage, because sometimes it's difficult to love people we don't love and to serve people we don't really like very much. Um, but you, you t don't tell us to only do it to people who, are, who it's easy to do it to. He wants us to love and serve um, maybe people who are unkind to us. But he, 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 loves, he loves us all, and he wants us to love um, other people the way he loves them. Lord, thank you, and give us that boldness and that courage. I thank you for everything you've given us in your son's precious name. Amen. Without 
Well, welcome this morning again. I was thinking when Mary Ellen introduced me as Pastor Mark earlier, I was thinking maybe she did that because it might give you a glimpse of what he might look like when he's 40 years older. <laughs> maybe not. Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> anyway, our, our lesson today for the message is from the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, the 37th chapter. Ezekiel chapter 37, I'm going to begin reading with verse 1 on through verse 14. Ezekiel 37, verse 1 through 14. This is Ezekiel talking here. He says, The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of a valley, and it was full of bones. He led me all around them, and there were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, And say to them, O you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So Ezekiel says, I prophesied as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh came on them, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. And I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves. And, O my people, I will bring you back into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves, and I bring you up from your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place on you your own soil, place you on your own soil. And then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord our God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's look to God in prayer. Our Father, we pray now that as we meditate on your word, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you see the title of the sermon in the bulletin this morning, I've actually changed the title as I worked on the sermon. And the new title, you can hope remember, is A Vision of Hope for People in Despair. And I thought if we ever lived in a time when we needed people to have hope, In a time of despair, it's now that we're going through. But it can apply to all things. I open with a story today. A story about the College of William and Mary, which is the second oldest university in the United States, second to Harvard. William and Mary was an outstanding college for about 150 years. And then the Civil War came. And as the Civil War came, and then after the Civil War, the period of Reconstruction, the College of William and Mary went bankrupt. And they had to close the doors, and the buildings were vacated, 
as many other colleges, especially in the South, had to be vacated and had closed their doors. And people had given up and thought it's finished. It's a dead college now. But the president of the college, by the name of you, his last name Ewell, he had put so much of his life into the College of William and Mary, and he was not about, not about to give up on it. And so, even though people thought it was dead, even though people thought there was no hope for it reopening, he decided that he was going to work toward that. And every day, and every day for seven years, he went to the campus, and he went up into the bell tower, and he rang the bell, welcoming students back to the campus. People thought he was crazy. But this is this campus, and that's not going to be revived. It's gone. But every day he did it because he had a vision that that would be, and he had hope. And eventually, as the story goes, some of the faculty came back, students began to come back, money began to come back in, and today it's one of the outstanding universities in the country, the College of William and Mary. One man, the president of the college, had hope. And that's what my message is about today. What God wants us to have, it's hope. Even in times of despair. And the man I want to talk to you about today is the man by the name of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a priest in the temple at Jerusalem in about 587 AD. Later, he was known not only as being a priest, but he was known as a prophet. Now, a prophet is one who proclaims the message of God. And so he proclaimed the message of God. And there was something else about Ezekiel. He not only was a priest, he was not only a prophet, but he was a man who loved God. And he was a man who loved Israel. And now about the people of Israel. In about 587 AD, Babylon, under the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar, stormed the southern kingdom of, of Israel, which known as Judah, and they began a war with them. The war lasted 13 years. One-third of the soldiers who were in the war died in battle. One-third literally died of famine. And then a one-third, not only of soldiers, but one-third of leaders of the people of Judah were taken into exile by the Babylonians when they won the skirmish. And the battle, it's interesting, would take place in a valley when they were not, no longer battling each other. They would go up into the hillside, and that's where they would stay. But when they come to battle, they would go down into the valley. And in during this period of exile, and by the way, Ezekiel was also taken into exile for many years. Now going to the children of Israel, a thousand years before, they were delivered from the bondage in Egypt. And they praised God for his deliverance through the wilderness to the promised land. A thousand years though. A thousand years, a lot of things changes. People get used to all the good things that God provides. And before long, and we know that happens even today, doesn't it? They began to forget. Forget what God had done for them. And before long, they began to sin and turn away from God. And then the result was they were attacked and taken over by the Babylonians for many, many years. But you see, even though God undoubtedly allowed that, God never stopped loving them. And he sent a prophet priest who also loved them, Ezekiel. Ezekiel loved the people of Israel, uh, the, the people, yes, of Israel, of Judah. And his heart was burdened for them. Because you see, though they had been captive other times, Take it with, uh, through other skirmishes. Something was different this time. They had lost their hope. And no matter what happens in your life or my life and the life of anyone we know, as long as we can have our hope that something is going to change, there's, 
we can see a future that's different from the time of being in captivity. And so out of his love for them, undoubtedly he was praying. And then God comes to him in a vision. Now we don't know whether God came to him in a vision through a dream or whether God took him out into a valley. We don't know exactly. Probably, I believe it probably was a dream that God gave him. And God took him down into the valley where the skirmishes had been, the battles had been. And in that valley, it says, there were bones all over the place. Not connected together, but just bones everywhere. And it says not only were there bones all over the valley, but the bones were very dry. So that if you touched a bone, it would just scatter to dust and be gone. And God shows Ezekiel this valley of bones show Ezekiel the condition of the children of Israel because they had lost their hope they were like dry bones in an open valley then God asks Ezekiel a question he says son of man can these bones live in other words is there hope for them I love Ezekiel's answer he says, Lord God, thou knowest. God, you know all about it. Isn't that wonderful? No matter what you're going through, somebody else might not understand. They might not even care. But God understands and God cares. He says, God, you know all about it. And God, I'm going to trust you. Oh, what a wonderful answer to God. And because he gave God that answer, God then gave him a commandment. God said to him, I want you to prophesy, Ezekiel. Now, to prophesy means two different things. Prophecy means to foretell something, to tell the future. We often think of prophecy as that. But it also means to foretell to proclaim, to preach. And in this instance, he wanted Ezekiel as a prophet to foretell, to foretell the people that they need to go to the word of God, to go to God, to listen to God, rather listen to God's word, what God had to say to them. What did God want? Now this is what God said to them. God said to them, I'm going to give you life. You feel like you're dead now. There's no hope for you. I'm going to give you life. In the New Testament, it talks about, and I love that, it talks about abundant life. And God says to them, I'm going to give you life. And then he says, I'm going to return you, the second promise from God. I'm going to return you back to your homeland. Think of what that must have been a message to the people. And then he said, then God had something for them to tell God for them to do for God. Two things. One, they needed to repent. They needed to turn back to God. That's the first step in anything. Reconciliation with God and asking God to help us in anything. It's turning back to God and doing what God wants. Turn back to God. Repent. Change your ways. And then follow God. And Ezekiel says, he obeyed God. There's a song I learned as a kid. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And Ezekiel trusted God and he obeyed God. You can't do anything better as a Christian in your walk with God than to trust and obey. And he did that. And wow, what happened. You want drama? Wow, drama. It happened there. I want to be sure to read this right. I don't want to mix it up. We have a few doctors in our church, and I don't want to get it mixed up, one bone connected to the wrong bone. <laughs> but they got, you know, this is one of my favorite spirituals. In my church in Bronxville, every year we have a, a service of spirituals. I love that. It's wonderful. I hope someday you'll have it here. Remember that song? Dem bones, dem bones, dem dry bones. 
Them bones, them bones. I better put my glasses on. That's not part of the bones. Them bones, them bones, them dry bones. Now here is the word of the Lord. The toe bone connected to the foot bone. I should have had Swain come up and do this. The toe bone connected to the foot bone. The foot bone connected to the leg bone. The leg bone connected to the knee bone. The knee bone connected to the thigh bone. The thigh bone connected to the back bone. The back bone connected to the neck bone. The neck bone connected to the head bone. I don't think to the head bone, but. Uh, oh, hear the word of the Lord. All those bones that were dry and scattered about, they began to come together all over the place. They probably had a duck to see all those. And they were forming skeletons. And not only did they form skeletons, then sinews and flesh came on and then skin covered them. What an, when Ezekiel obeyed God, but there was something still missing. Though they came together and now were not bones, just scattered about dry, they were actually bodies. But what was wrong was they were still dead. They were still dead. So God tell, gives Ezekiel another commandment. God says, now I want you to prophesy to the wind, to the breath rather. Well, like the wind. I want you to prophesy to the breath. And say to the breath, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain. And Ezekiel did that. And then he stopped. And you know what happened? God took over. And the Spirit of God came into those corpses, those bodies who were there, and they came to life. And they stood up like a mighty army ready to serve God and go forward. And God said to Israel, if you'll repent, if you'll follow me and change your ways, you will go from dead pieces of dry bone in an open valley and you'll become a mighty force for God. Wow, what a message of hope for those people. Well, I thought about that and I thought about us. How does it apply to us? We all know what it's like to be in a valley, don't we? I think of a, a famous Christian author, Johnny Erickson, Tata. Young lady, as a young lady, a wonderful diver, athlete hit something and she was paralyzed from the neck down from then on. She turned it over to God and how God has used her. She's a great speaker. But I thought, I wonder when she had first happened, she may have thought, is there any hope? Can I go on? That'd be a normal reaction, wouldn't it? I've st stood at the graveside with people, widows sometimes, lost their husband. And they look down into the grave as the body is being lowered into the ground and they say to themselves very often, and I've heard it, can I go on in that valley? Can I go on? Well, yes, we can go on if we do certain things. If we admit to God what we're going through. God doesn't want us to talk to him with rose-colored glasses. I used to talk about Sunday go to church mass, but I can't do that anymore because everybody has a Sunday mass now. But we do have mass, don't we? Everything's all right, I'm smiling away, everything's all right. Like preachers sometimes, you know, they get together. Well, how's your church? Oh, it's wonderful. It is fantastic. We'll talk to them about 20 minutes, for about 20 minutes. And, well, there are a few things. And the same with lay people about the preacher, too. I mean, not just one side. But, you know, 
you go through difficult times. We admit what we're going through. And if we have sin in our lives, we admit that to God. And then the next thing after we admit it to God, then we look to God and we trust God and say, God, you know all about it. And God, I'm going to trust you. Like Ezekiel said, son of man, God said, can these bones live? And he said, Lord God, you know all about it. God knows all about us, doesn't he? Can't. That's why the Bible says as a person thinks in his or her heart, so is he. Because when God looks at us, he looks beyond the outer veneer and he looks at our very hearts. And he knows all about us. And we look to God and we say, God, I can't do it. I can't do it, God. But I believe you will. Now, does that mean God's going to deliver us from everything immediately? Sometimes we have to go through it. But you know what? Even greater than that, God will give us the grace to go through it. If we look and trust God. But we, we're so human. At least I am. Try to do it myself. You ever do that? You find you're in a worse mess than we started? So you throw up your hand and say, help, Lord. I love that Psalm 12, the first two words, help, Lord. That's all you need to pray sometimes, by the way. Help, Lord, and God will be there. And so we say, help, Lord, and then God begins to work, and he'll give us, tell us and teach us through the Spirit of God and through the Word of God what he wants us to do. And he'll give us the inner grace and the strength and other people to support us. That's why the local church is so important, the fellowship of believers. And then he will take us from a time of hopelessness and take us to a time of great hope when we trust in him. We all go through valleys. I was reading the story of a man by the name of uh, Charles Plum, he's an author of a book, I Am No Hero. He was in the Vietnam War. His plane, he had a pilot, uh, fighter pilot plane he was flying, and it had trouble and it crashed. He was able to get out before it crashed, but he landed in enemy territory. He was in a six by six little cell for, uh, eight by eight cell, for six years, horrible, horrible conditions. He said they'd come and get him and they'd put ropes on him and stretch his body to just pull and torture him. He said he didn't think he could go through anymore when he was about to just almost give up. One day he saw a, a little piece of wire go through from another cell, the bamboo division, and he realized somebody was over there and they developed a code of the alphabet so they could send messages to to, to each other. There were over 200 going, being treated just like he was. He went through that for six years. When he finally got out, sent back home, he called his wife. There was no answer. He tried to reach her. He couldn't find her. He called his father and his father told him she had left him. And he said, he thought the bottom would fall out totally. But his father was a Christian, encouraged him to trust the Lord and to look to God for hope. And he did, and it gave him hope. You see, that's the answer. When we're going through difficult times and we go through them, through despair, just like Ezekiel did, he looked to God who has the answers to guide and direct him to get his eyes on the Lord. I close with the story. A novelist tells us, doing research for one of her novels, she was down in the Coney Island section here of New York, and she was sitting on the pier kind of cold out, and a homeless man came and sat next to her. 
And they began to talk, and he began to tell her about himself and so on. And he kept saying to her, look out there, isn't that wonderful? And she said to him, well, what do you do when it gets real cold? He said, well, sometimes I go to a church where there's some shelter. He said, but I prefer not to. She said, well, why not? Why not do that? He said, lady, look at the view. I get my eye on this view. That's what I need. That helps me. That sustains me. And as I read that, I thought, it's not a view we need to get our eyes on to see us through, is it? It's the Lord, the Lord Jesus, who will see us through, even though we might come fighting and kicking, but God will see us through if we'll but turn it over to him, as Ezekiel did for the children of Israel, and God sent them back to their homeland, the land of Judah. Amen. At this time, part of our worship service is receiving our tithes and offerings and giving, receiving our tithes and offerings to giving to the Lord. As Margaret plays, and I always look forward to Margaret playing for this, we will invite you to come keeping social distance to put your offering in the plate. You at home again, we invite you also to be sure to send in your offering. The church has expenses, they remain the same even though we can't have full attendance in the worship services. We invite you to do that. God bless you. Let us ask God's blessing on the offering. Our Father, we pray now that you would bless this offering for your glory and use it for the work of the ministry, both here and through the outreach ministries of the church. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing in our closing hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Sorry about that, and the pastor talking about dry bones. We had the first rehearsal today for the choir after one year. It was a miracle. A miracle, wonderful. Thank the Lord. 
Anyway, we have a few spots opening for you. If you want to join, we are starting at 9.30 every Sunday. And uh, I was uh, so overwhelmed by the spirit, not only the participants coming in their busy schedule. So we are so grateful Amen. studying this. And uh, the pastor picked this so sweet to trust in Jesus. This song I sang during World War II. I still remember Korean words, Korean text. I ended up singing in Korean while you are singing in English. And uh, this is, I don't know who says it's an old hymn, but when I sing this hymn, it becomes ever new. Praise the Lord. so glad to have you in the service and you folks listening at home. It's always a joy to get together with God's people to worship the Lord. Let's stand for the uh, closing benediction. And now may the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Son, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit rest and abide in each one until we meet again. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.